Hey there, whenever and wherever, excuse me, <clears throat> let's try that again. Hello, wherever and whenever you might be watching, welcome, especially if this is your first time here, Adventist or otherwise. My guest tonight is Matt Slick. He's a Christian apologist, uh, founder of the Christian, Re or Christian Apologetics Research Ministry, CARM.org. More than likely, if you Google a Christian subject, you've probably gotten a hit for CARM.org, as it is one of the oldest apologetic sites on the internet. We're going to be having some fun tonight as we will be kicking off a uh, new segment of the show. It will uh, by no means be an exhaustive discussion. We only have a limited amount of time, but we will cover a variety of topics and let our guest bless us with his knowledge. But before getting into all of that, Folks, I mention this a lot. Please use the Answering Adventism website. It is our gift to you for your benefit. It is being updated regularly. The articles are always filled with hyperlinks to primary source materials for you to investigate and examine for yourself. With only a few clicks, we have saved you a lot of digging and time. You can contact us there, share your testimony, access our library of resources. You can browse the entire video library and more. Please use the site. We get lots and lots of emails, and it's hard to respond to everyone, and oftentimes we get questions about things that are on the site. Uh, maybe we need to get some feedback from people on how to better find things. Maybe people aren't able to find them. Uh, but use that handy little search bar up at the top of the website. It is a powerful tool. You can type in keywords. You can type in phrases. You can type in names. So uh, play around with that to your heart's content. Also want to give a big shout out to those of you who have partnered with us, whether that is through the member section here on YouTube or elsewhere. We're super grateful for you and your support. There will be some exciting updates on that front uh, come springtime. But with that said, let's get right into it. Matt Slick, thank you for being here, sir. Well, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Absolutely. So for those not aware, tell the audience a little bit about yourself and your background in Christian apologetics. Well, I got saved when I was 17, 50 years ago. I'm 67. I started studying apologetics in 1980. Uh, did swap meet ministry door to door, dressed up like a punker, went to the beach in Southern California, uh, phone ministry, uh, varying things, passed out literature, all kinds of stuff. And uh, went to a Lutheran college and ended up at a Presbyterian seminary. And uh, I'm a very staunch a defender of Calvinism. I can defend it very well and uh, have been doing so for 33 years. I got my MDiv, my Master's of Divinity from Westminster Theological Seminary. And back in 95, when the internet was new, this new thing called the internet, uh, someone oh, they had these things beforehand called bulletin boards. Not many people know that, but there are bulletin boards before the internet was really the internet. You go on and you dial up on your phone, you know, and uh, leave a message, then you come back a couple hours later, dial up on the phone, see what people wrote. And I had uh, these, uh, a, bit, a lot of notebooks of information that I'd written because a lot of people would ask the same kind of a thing. I was always able to just kind of remember stuff and answer questions. And so then when the internet came out, I taught myself how to develop a web page only for the reason, only for the reason of just not having to type out the same answers all the time. Hey, look at one of those website things. And I can just say, hey, here's an answer. Here's, un not that I have all the right answers, but here's an answer, here's my answer. And uh, I remember when we got 72 uh, visitors in one day and I was, I was ecstatic. And uh, at one point we were getting 97,000 a day. And um, now we're down to about 30 to 35,000. And uh, that's another discussion. The site's had 160 million visitors. Um, been on radio for 23 years, written nine books, and uh, do debates and stuff like that. So there you go. All right. Matt, what got you particularly interested or rather engaged with, with cults in particular? Because I've listened to quite a bit of you. I've consumed a lot of your uh, material content, radio program, that sort of thing. And you uh, you always say, if you want to talk about unity, Islam, Baha'i, and you kind of run off a big list of cults. What got you specifically in that lane? Well, I've been saved very dramatically when I was 17 years old. The super short version is um, that I went up forward tricked got walking up forward to receive uh jesus as my savior and decided to give him a try that was my attitude 
and uh, give him a shot. And I'll try and be sincere. And all I can tell you is the Holy Spirit himself uh, overshadowed me with such incredible power that I was reduced to a sobbing mass of tears. The undulating presence of his holiness just was washing over me, exposing everything I was. I could not get my face to the ground any further down what it was, heaving, almost puking out, just agony uh, in the presence of incredible holiness. And then Jesus was next to me. Uh, I couldn't see him, couldn't touch him. It wasn't like that. But even 50 years later, I remember, I could still just see it, hear it, feel it. The uh, the presence uh, of his concern for me. He was behind me two feet, uh, to my left, about two feet. I just, just remember uh, he was there. And um, I remember his attention. I remember uh, his concern. I remember everything. I remember being afraid, expectant, hopeful, uh, just didn't know what would happen. And um, in the midst of all of this, I was just heaving out tears of agony. Uh, I was in the presence of incredible holiness. And then um, Jesus stepped into me and my sin left was gone. And uh, that was uh, 50 years ago. I've calmed down quite a bit since then. So that's the background to something that a friend of mine who I'm still friends with was at a Bible study. He read me a quote and it enraged me, made me mad. And uh, that's what started studying me, started me studying cults. And the quote was from Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism. History of the Church, Volume 6, page 408, 409, he says, in all these affidavits, in his, all these indictments, it is all the devil, all corruption, you false swears, all hell boil over you, burning mountains or down your lava, for I will come out on the top at last. I have more to boast of it than, than ever any man had. I've done more to keep a church together since the days of Adam. I boast no man's ever done such a work as I. The followers of Jesus uh, ran away from him. He says that neither, neither John, Paul, Peter, nor Jesus ever did such a work as I. The followers of Christ ran away from him, but the Latter-day Saints have never run away from me yet. That uh, made me so mad uh, that I knew whoever said that was, uh, was not a Christian. There's no way. And uh, that started me studying Mormonism from there to Jehovah's Witnesses, from there to everything else. And I've been doing this uh, ever since. And so I've been doing it for 44 years. Well, when I see you in a couple of weeks, maybe we can uh, talk about our testimonies because I think we have a very similar testimony in that regard and kind of the same sort of uh, flame that kind of ignited the passion for um, cults. Now, good. before we transition to our, our, our main segment for the night, mm -hmm. what are some of the common beliefs that you see shared across the board with cults that you've studied? So whether it's Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, Baha'i, et cetera. What are some of the common threads and themes that you see in all of those groups? It's easy. False God, false Christ, false gospel. Those are the uh, common things. When you don't have a tr the true God, the Trinitarian being, who's one being and three distinct simultaneous co-eternal persons in a perichoritic relationship with the divine simplicity, you don't have that. You don't have a true incarnation. And um, without that, you don't have a true uh, soteriological system that is monergistic. What happens is people will then start saying that you got to cooperate with God to be saved, maintain your salvation. And so the false religions that teach this are Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, Christian Science, Unity, Baha'i Islam, uh, Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, uh, and uh, Seventh-day Seventh Adventism, Adventism. too, depending on a couple of variables. Official yeah. SDA stuff is yeah. bad. But there are groups, I've met them, who deny uh, synergistic soteriology. So, yeah, but... Yeah, which is rather interesting because they're supposed to be uh, the restoration of apostolic Christianity and be a bastion of unity amidst all of the confused Protestants out there. Um, no, but no, as you no. just mentioned, they're a, a, a splintered, splintered mess. So you right. hit the nail on the head, though, that false Christ, essentially false God as well. False God, false Christ gospel. gospel. Yep. yep. I right. hammer that on this platform all the time. That is what I'm constantly yeah. telling people. That's the yeah. foundation. So for the main section tonight, that will be the focus as to the baseline. And of course, knowing Matt, I know that your baseline is going to be based off of scripture. Ultimately, yeah, yeah, um, right. and, and so your answers will be based off of that, and you are a wealth of knowledge in this area, so I'm sure you'll be able to present why you give your answers. So, with that said, folks, Christian. Christian. Oh, no. congratulations, Matt. You are the first guest to come on and play Christian. 
or not. Okay. The Answering Adventism Theological Quiz Show, where Christian apologists, theologians, and scholars listen to various theological statements put forth by the SDA Church to determine if they align with Christian orthodoxy or not. Nah. We will have five rounds total. So after listening to a series of statements, I will ask you, Christian or not? Nah, you will give your answer. And if you hear this, you answered correctly, and then you can explain why. If you hear this, you answered incorrectly, I think, and I'll explain why. So along the way, I'll give a little bit of commentary just to clarify and connect some dots for both you and the audience. Sound good, Matt? Well, it might be interesting because I'm more detailed than most people are. So we might have some interesting conversations. You'll be uh, you'll be uh, embraced on this platform, especially on this outlet. The live streams tend to be exactly what that is. So feel free to be as detailed as possible. You mentioned some terms there, folks, if you've been tuning in uh, the past few weeks. Matt used some terms that you've heard the past couple of weeks, perichoresis, one be or a one singular being, three persons, these sorts of things, hypostatic union, et cetera. So, Matt, feel free to be as detailed as possible. But with that oh. said, round one. We're going to start with the authority of Ellen G. White. Okay. So in the Review and Herald, the SDA Church's official paper, they wrote this in the June 3rd, 1971 issue. Quote, Protestants have always claimed that the Bible is its own interpreter. Perhaps it is better to say the spirit of prophecy, we use the term here as synonymously with the gift of prophecy, or testimony of Jesus is its own interpreter. The Bible is an infallible guide, but it needs to be infallibly interpreted to avoid confusion and division. Close quote. <laughs> so they believe that the phrase spirit of prophecy found in Revelation is wherever Jesus is speaking, since it says the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. They believe that that was manifested in the writings of Ellen White. Thus, her writings then function as the infallible interpreter of the Bible because it's supposedly Jesus doing the interpreting. In tandem with this, we see the SDA Church's Statement of Confidence in the Writings of Ellen G. White, which is put out by the General Conference, which states, in part, quote, We reaffirm our conviction, this is from 2015, we reaffirm our conviction that her writings are divinely inspired, truly Christ-centered, and Bible-based. Rather than replacing the Bible, they uplift the normative character of Scripture and correct inaccurate interpretations of it derived from tradition, human reason, personal experience, and modern culture, close quote. And then lastly, former GC president G.I. Butler said this about her writings, quote, our position on the testimonies, which is the writings of Ellen White, it's just a nomenclature, is like the keystone to the arch. Take that out, and there's no logical stopping place till all the special truths of the message are gone. Our enemies and the master they serve realize this, but some of our people are so blind that they do not. Close quote. We will be looking at some of these special truths in a bit, but Matt, is this Christian or not? Nah? It's cultic. That's cult. Right. Yeah. So, you know, Jesus says in uh, Luke 16, 16, the law and the prophets were until John, there are no more prophets. What is inspired is not any individual. Even a prophet is not until he writes and only by the work of the Holy Spirit upon him at that time. So in 2 Timothy 3.16, the scriptures, the graphe, are what's called theopneustos. They're the things that are inspired. Ellen G. White obviously is not a prophet or a prophetess. She's a false teacher. She was not inspired. And for anybody to say that she was inspired is foolishness, ignorance, and is nothing more than being brainwashed in a cult. And that's what that is. It's cult mentality, cult practice. The same kind of a thing occurs with the idea of submitting yourself in cult mentality. You submit yourself to the authority of an individual or a church over you. It's not Jesus in the scriptures that you're submitting to. It's the person, Joseph Smith, Ellen G. White, Charles Taze Russell whoever it might be, Muhammad, and you submit to that authority or you submit to a church structure, the Roman Catholic Church or the East Orthodox Church. And this is just variations of the same thing. So it's lifting her up to a level that she does not deserve. And obviously she fails uh, uh, doctrinal tests all over the place, left and right. She's a slimy cultist. 
Yeah, the thing that's so interesting about that, Matt, is that is like a key thing what, that I try to bring up with them in this discussion of, I'll just go down the road with you and I'll say, okay, let's say that, uh, yeah, profits the way you guys have, have put forth are still valid. Now let's test to see if Ellen passes. Well, then it starts to get a little squeamish. It starts yeah. to get when we use the Jeremiah 23 uh, test or the Deuteronomy 18 test, et cetera. Now, the reason we started there is to demonstrate why on this platform, I'm constantly citing Ellen White. Matt mentioned earlier, he knows that there are groups of SDAs out there. I say this all the time as well, having grown up in Adventism. Yes, I know that there are people out there that downplay the writings of Ellen White. This platform is about the official organization and the stated positions, though. Not every individual out there. You're going to find every individual out there having their own view on all sorts of things. I engage with hundreds of Adventists every week, and that's the case. But her writings hold more authority than any SDA scholar, pastor, professor, or lay member. It's irrelevant what they say if it doesn't align with Ellen White. So with that in mind, let's look at some of their theology now, Matt, around their doctrine of God. First up, the Adventist Heavenly Trio. So notice what she says here. Quote, the comforter that Christ promised to send after he ascended to heaven is the spirit in all the fullness of the Godhead, making manifest the power of divine grace to all who receive and believe in Christ as a personal savior. There are three living persons of the heavenly trio. In the name of these three great powers, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, those who receive Christ by living faith are baptized, and these powers are will cooperate with the obedient subjects of heaven in their efforts to live the new life in Christ. Close quote. We then find this on their website, on the page dedicated to the Trinity, under the heading, How Does the Trinity Work Together? Quote, Have you ever been on a winning team? A team of students at school raising money? A team of coworkers trying to meet a sales goal? A community sports team? It's fun to be on the winning team. A team has a common goal. While each person may fill a different role, they all work together to accomplish the mission. The triune God may be compared to a winning team. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit work together in ways that a human team would never be able to for a common goal. While each person of the Godhead has a distinct role in the plan of salvation, they unite in their mission. Close quote. So the Adventist heavenly trio in comparison to Orthodox Trinitarianism looks like this. The Adventist heavenly trio are three separate self-sustaining beings who are united in a mission. That's what the SDA church means by one God. So Matt, is this Christian or not? Well, as you presented here on the right, that's obviously not Christian. But um, the thing is, when it says a heavenly trio, whenever I talk to people, I always like to define, get their definitions, because sometimes I'll have a right definition without a wrong, I mean, with a wrong term. So there are three living persons, and that's correct. There are three, we would, I wouldn't say living persons, but they are living by default. But she's cried, uh, correct in there that there are three persons, the Father, Son, Holy yep. Spirit. And she says that's a heavenly trio. That's not a proper terminology theologically to use, but I would say, okay, what do you mean by that? Do you mean one God or do you mean three gods? If she says one God, okay, I wouldn't use the term heavenly trio in the name of these three great powers. Why are you selling, saying powers? These are, again, not terms that recognized theologians would, would uh, use. And this is significant because... When you start using terminology that's not historically consistent and has been filtered and been purified through examination and cross-examination, then what you do is you introduce potentially new concepts that can then be interpreted in a manner inconsistent with what the Christian church, by the power of God, has through the centuries determined. And uh, to say that they are a team, that's something you would say to five-year-old. They're like a team. You don't say that kind of stuff to an adult. Uh, <laughs> and so that's bad. And if I were uh, talking to any SDA and they use that terminology, I would politely say, 
here are the reasons we don't want to use a terminology. Here's the correct terminology. This is what it means. It's not why you want to say a team. It doesn't work like that. And then I would teach them on the ontological trinity, economic trinity, perichoresis, and inseparable operations. And make sure they got all that down. Yeah, Matt, it's going to be a long night. We're going to get into a lot of this. Uh, we're breaking the ice here, so you'll get uh, you'll get some of your answers. We just did a uh, four-hour burial service of the SDA pioneers last week, um, looking at uh, their anti-Trinitarian views. You're going to see what they mean by person. You're going to see what they mean by the term God, um, really? etc. So let's start uh, with this now. So yeah. central to Adventism is their pre-Earth origin story. Ellen White writes, quote, God is the father of Christ. Christ is the son of God. To Christ has been given an exalted position. He has been made equal with the father. All the counsels of God are open to his son. Close quote. So this is in reference, Matt, to what took place supposedly before the creation of the earth. The primary telling of that narrative being this. Quote, the great creator assembled the heavenly host that he might in the presence of all the angels confer special honor upon his son. The son was seated on the throne with the father and the heavenly throng of holy angels was gathered around them. The father then made known that it was ordained by himself that Christ, his son, should be equal with himself. So that wherever was the presence of his son, it was as his own presence. Close quote. So Matt. Let me fill you in here on some details. This is before, like I said, the creation of the earth. In the Adventist worldview, this exaltation is what made Lucifer jealous, which led to what they call the great controversy between Christ and Satan. When they read, for example, that war broke out in heaven in Revelation, they insert this pre-earth origin narrative from Ellen White into that. Lucifer became jealous of Jesus being exalted over himself, which led to him attacking the law of God, which they believe is a transcript of God's character. So in essence, Lucifer began attacking God's character and saying the heavenly trio is unfair, tyrannical, these sorts of things. We will look at that more further downstream. But with regard to Jesus being made equal with the Father, is this Christian or nah? Well, definitely not. However, what do you do when they say in Acts 2.36, therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him, Jesus, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now that, however, is talking about his ministry on earth, not before everything. Correct. And that, that's the incarnation. That's right. That's the critical issue. Yep. So when it says to Christ has been given an exalted position, uh, that, that's not possible in the trinitarian communion and this is why the doctrine of the trinity is so critically important the trinity is that god is three simultaneous and distinct persons father son holy spirit the ontological trinity comes from the greek ontos which means essence nature the ontological trinity states that they all the three persons share the exact same divine nature so god's nature is divinely simple God is one being, the divinely simple being that is Trinitarian in its essence and in its nature. So where the way time, past, present, and future is Trinity-ish in its nature, I'm really stretching that a bit. God, he himself is triune in his nature, in his ontos, his nature and his essence. That's what he is. So the persons are always in the state of equality, the divine essence. There can be no sense in which one is exalted above another or better than another or greater than another in the triune communion. The economic trinity is the position that the father elects, for example, the son redeems, yeah. Holy Spirit applies redemptive work. What that is showing is that there's a difference of function in the Trinitarian essence as they relate to the to the world. So I can, get, I can expand on this quite a bit, but uh, don't need to now. So when it says that Christ has been exalted, uh, an exalted position, the problem I'm having here is the word Christ by definition refers to the incarnate one. So this is why I, I'm curious. I, I, me, if you guys have ever watched me do anything or debate or something, I'll say, what do you mean by that? 
because I'll say if, if someone were to say to an SDA were to quote this to say this is in reference to before the foundation of the world, I'd say then Christ here is the Messiah. Are you is this Christ the person of Jesus with two distinct natures, or are you talking about is the pre-incarnate Christ, which is fine. Which is it? And I have to know because I know my details so well. I need to know their details so well that I can poke holes in their theology. And uh, so there's a problem there. But uh, confer the special honor on his son. Uh, that's not biblical. First Corinthians 4, 6 says you're not to exceed what's written. Don't, don't exceed what's written in the word of God. She does it obviously all the time. The father made uh, then made known that it was ordained by himself that Christ, his son, should be equal with himself. Should be. Oh my goodness, um, the this gets in. I, I don't know how much you want to let me talk on this, but we're talking about eternal sonship here. Let me do this really quickly. Eternal sonship deals with the intertrinitarian communion, the eternal covenant, Hebrews thirteen twenty, that deals with the issue of the Father always being the one who sent the Son, because it's the nature of the eternal covenantal plan of God, the one being that it would always be the elect, Ephesians 1, 4. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. And in him is a reference to, to uh, the pre-incarnate Christ and ultimately the incarnation, which means that the son, Jesus, always had to be the one who would be the son in relationship to the father, who'd be the one sent you know, so we could have federal headship in him so that Jesus could be the one by whom the elect are then redeemed. So uh, this is just basic Christian theology that most people don't don't know. And so uh, to say that he should be equal to himself uh, makes no sense. It's self-refuting. It's just basically we say in theology, it sucks canal water. <laughs> yeah. Well, like I said, we did four hours uh, and, and a lot of the things you're talking about, folks, you can go and check that stream out. We I talk or not we, but I talk about that in great detail um, in, in that stream regarding things like uh, the hypostatic union, et cetera. Matt. Uh, something I got to tell you, though, and the, the kind of the, the big issue with a lot of this, and as you're going to see in this this next quote here, this is going to become a lot more clear. Um, they reject divine simplicity. Okay. So um, that's interesting. But, so when they use the term God, it's more in like a familial sense. That's partialism. But, C correct. So they've parted God out. They reject the well. Well, let's let's not get ahead of ourselves here. Let's look at the uh, let's look at the next next thing here. God the Father has a physical body. So, quote, this is from a vision. I saw a throne and on it sat the Father and the Son. I gazed on Jesus' countenance and admired his lovely person. The Father's person I could not behold. For a cloud of glorious light covered him. I asked Jesus if his Father had a form like himself. He said he had, but I could not behold it. For said he, if you should see, or, or if you should once behold the glory of his person, you would cease to exist. Close quote. So Jesus could be beholden, but not the Father. He was too, he was far too glorious. But speaking of God the Father, she also said this. Quote, the Father is all the fullness of the Godhead bodily and is invisible to mortal sight. The Father is all the fullness of the Godhead bodily and is invisible to mortal sight, close quote. Now, commenting on that first quote, Ellen's vision talking to Jesus, one of their scholars had this to say. This is what they mean when they use the term persons. Matt, you commented on this earlier. Well, it, she said three persons. Quote, now he's, he's citing Ellen White here, or quoting what we just part of what we just read. I've often seen the lovely Jesus that he is a person. I asked him if his father was a person and had a form like himself, said Jesus. I am in the express image of my father's person. Thus, her visions confirmed what her husband had written in 1846, that the father and the son are two distinct, literal, tangible persons. The visions also disproved to her mind the claim of the Methodist creed that God is without body or parts. Thus, these early visions steered her developing view of God away from creedal Trinitarianism, though they offered nothing directly contrary to her later statements of what I have called biblical Trinitarianism. Close quote. So when the SDA church uses the term person, they mean a literal, tangible form. Like in the previous quote, she couldn't behold the Father's form. He ontologically has a body. Matt, is this Christian or nah? It's cultic. 
Yeah, it's bad news. Because the word person in relation to the Trinity has a special meaning, has a theologically significant meaning. Yep. Because person comes from the Latin persona, mask, and the actors would use these different masks for different acting parts. And so they borrowed the term. And so personhood demonstrates centers of consciousness, so to speak, uh, like self-awareness, awareness of others can speak, say you, your, me, mine, can love, can hate. And the persons of the Trinity uh, do this, but they also, also show distinction and they communicate about one another to each other. And so this is why logic requires that the Trinity be one God in three distinct simultaneous persons. Only the son has a tangible body and he forever will be a man. A lot of people don't know that, but he's a man right now in a glorified yeah. resurrected body, retaining the crucifixion wounds and he will forever be like that. But the father does not have any corporeal form like that. It's not a tangible uh, form like that, because if he were, which is, it's just, this is, I call it stupidification to stupidify, all right? So uh, God, the Father, has a body of flesh and bones. Well, then there are groups that teach that kind of a thing. Mormonism does, and so they'll teach that the Holy Spirit is not the same thing as the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is the third God, but the Holy Spirit is the presence of God because God is limited in his physical, tangible body, so he has to be everywhere by the power of something else other than himself. So this is a denial of the true nature of God, and uh, if that's what uh, she was teaching, there is no possible way from what I've seen that she could be considered a true Christian woman, and she was a cult leader teaching false doctrines. That is what they teach. They teach the Holy Spirit is the presence of the Father and the Son in their physical absence. Um, they have since come around to trying to say, well, the Holy Spirit is a person. Um, and Ellen White, in the same paper, again, in the stream I just referenced last week, we went over uh, Mr. Moon's whole paper here, and people saw that they teach that the Holy Spirit has a form like the Father and the Son, and he's walking around on earth, but he's invisible. He has a physical body, but he's invisible. You know, I have a T-shirt yeah. that says "So much heresy, so little time." Yeah. <laughs> um, who's that bald guy? Does SDA teaching? Well, I forgot his name. Doug Batchelor. Doug Batchelor. I was out uh, in Tennessee a couple of years ago, three years ago, at uh, a big meeting of, of Christian broadcasters and stuff, and I saw him. I walked up to him, and I said, uh, "Hello." I, his name was there. I remember his name then, but you know, I said, "Mr. So and So." I said, "I've seen you on TV and stuff." And he was really polite. And I said, look, my name is Matt Slick. I'm a Christian apologist. And uh, I would like to offer a polite challenge to debate you on the issues of Seventh-day mm -hmm. Adventism and the issue of justification, the nature of God, yeah, investigative but... judgment. And uh, just politely, I said, I'm not an average, your average guy. I, I, I study and, and I'd, I'd like to d debate you. I have an MDiv and, you know, stuff like that. And I said, you interested? And he said, no, thank you. Yeah, so... Well, I, I don't want to sidetrack on that, but you're not the first person that's told me um, that typically they only want to debate and it's not just Doug, but they typically only want to debate individuals who they think that they can maybe pull the wool over or maybe don't know the, the system as well. Yeah. Now, check this out, Matt. OK. This is Ellen White commenting on what she claimed to be shown by God during the crucifixion. This is from the Desire of Ages, folks. This is one of the big three. Remember. Selected Messages, Book 3, page 122, paragraph 2. The words in this book, barricaded by a thus saith the Lord. As if that's limited to just these three books, but it's part of one of the big three, the Conflict of the Ages series. Quote, Satan with his fierce temptations wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave, a conqueror, or tell him of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. Close quote. So while on the cross, Satan twisted the heart of Jesus, causing him to doubt his resurrection and if his sacrifice would be accepted. He was unable to see through the portals of the tomb through to the other side. Matt, is this Christian or nah? It's satanic crap. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. It's so what are the issues? What are the issues with this? Christologically. Oh man, it's hypostatic just, it's union of, issues. Just oh man, there's a lot of stuff here. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave, 
a conqueror. Hope did not present to him. Bad uh, terminology on her part. Or tell him of oh, the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. That's impossible. Jesus has yeah. two natures, both God and man. It's called the hypostatic union. And each nature has attributes. And the attributes of both natures are ascribed to the single person. This is called the communication of the properties or the yeah. Latin Communicato term communicatio, communicatio idiomatum. Right. And so uh, this means that the attributes of both divinity and humanity were ascribed to the single person, which means Jesus could say he knew all things. And he did, Matthew 28, uh, 18. He dwelt in all of us, uh, Matt, uh, John 14, 23, etc. So it's necessarily the case that he knew that the sacrifice would be acceptable. And why do we know that? Because from all eternity, the Trinity had ordained that it was so. See, when you have a bad God, you have bad Christ, you have a bad gospel. It just comes down to that. This is so offensive. Uh, it denies the eternality, the intertrinitarian communion to ordain whatsoever shall come to pass, Ephesians 1, 4 through 11. It denies, uh, basically, it risks the hypostatic union and seems to deny the communicatio idiomatum. And uh, then it says their separation was to be eternal. This uh, attacks divine simplicity and the very nature of the trinity itself to say there was a separation a lot of theologians when jesus said you know it is finished my god my god why have you forsaken me and all that um what does it mean is separated from the father it's impossible because the trinity cannot be separated the son cannot be in the eternal communion separated from the father uh, and, and the holy spirit it's impossible otherwise the trinity ceases to exist and so the idea of separation there's a lot of debate on what that means but uh, he was not separated from the Father. Uh, we could talk about that more some other time in some theories. But, uh, you know, it, what Ellen G. White reminds me of, seriously, is an amateur theologian with um, a mediocre understanding of theology, an ability to communicate, and who can't put these things together critically and thinks she knows better than others. And I, I encounter this kind of thing all the time. If she were alive now, I would absolutely challenge her to a debate, as would many people, and she wouldn't stand a chance because she does not know what she's doing biblically, uh, theologically. Yeah, she was not an integrative thinker. She wasn't no. able to, to, to think like, what I'm saying over here, how does that impact something over here? She's taking from one person over here and not understanding their system of theology yeah. and trying to pull something from this person over here and all this sort of stuff. Since you mentioned it, though, Matt, let's look at this really quick. Uh, this is on their website on a page regarding Jesus. The Son of God is born a human on earth. Now, Matt, they're going to try and pay lip service to the hypostatic union here, but I want you to catch the final paragraph, okay? It says, Jesus came to experience life as we do, as 100% human. Out of love for every single one of us, he chose to be stripped of his glory, Philippians 2, 6 through 8, okay? And was given no advantage over us when it comes to living a life without sin, Isaiah 53, 2. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, John 1, 14, but, was made, uh, uh, but this made him no less divine. Jesus was still 100% God, Matt. Okay. This concept that, and then it's bolded. The only thing bolded in the, in the section, that Jesus is 100% God and 100% human. There's the hypostatic union, Matt. That can be mind-boggling, but this was necessary in God's plan to deliver us from the grip of sin while the great controversy rages on, meaning both good and evil surround us daily, warring against one another. So Jesus, as part of the Godhead, had to live a perfect life, then his innocent blood could cover our sins and make it possible for us to inherit eternal life. Now get this. Philippians 2, 6-8, through 8, which they just cited earlier, says that even though Jesus is God, he set his divine nature aside and took on human nature, kenosis heresy. He came to serve us, to show us God's love for us and live as our example. They hold to the model man theory. He came to minister to people through his perfectly obedient life. He obeyed the Father in every way, even when it led to a humiliating death on a cross. Matt. Is that is the kenosis interpretation of Philippians 2 compatible with the hypostatic union? No, that's damnable heresy. It's damnable. Um, you have to understand 
that the one person of Christ has two distinct natures and the attributes of both natures are ascribed to the single person. That's by definition who Jesus is as a single person. If there was no divine nature in there, then there is no divine attribution. And without that, uh, you don't have the true person of who Christ is. You have equivalent uh, to what the Jehovah's Witnesses teach. Michael, the archangel, becoming a man, only human, died on the cross, torture stake. And so that makes the sacrifice of Christ insufficient. And I'll tell you why. See, our sins are against God. And so if we're going to sin against God, uh, we are not able to undo that which uh, we have aff affected against him. He's an infinite being. And if we sin against him, there's an infinite uh, consequence. That's eternal damnation. The only way to get out of that is with an eternally equivalent atoning sacrifice. That's himself who becomes one of us. So in the hypostatic union, we can understand that Jesus has two distinct natures, but only the human nature died on the cross, not the divine nature. The question then becomes, how is a sacrifice of divine value? Well, the answer is found in the communicatio idiomatum that the attributes of both natures are ascribed to the single person. The single person died on the cross, therefore the single person is of divine value. We have an atoning sacrifice that's sufficient. So by denying that he has the divine nature, then uh, you're denying who Christ is, you're denying the atoning sacrifice, and you are, are teaching damnable, damnable heresy, that if you believe it and teach it, you cannot be a Christian, you unless you repent but you cannot be a christian and you will go to eternal hellfire for it matt i'm gonna have to have you back sometime so we can talk about these these terms these fundamental terms that you keep using communicato idiomatum hypostatic union perichoresis these sorts of things because this stuff is so so important adventism mm -hmm. essentially denies all of these things they'll try and pay lip service to things like oh well uh, you know, Jesus was 100% God, 100% man, but then you find out the way they use God and it's like, oh, well, he's not actually truly omnipresent. He gave that up in the incarnation. He's present now through the Holy Spirit. Like that's not compatible with Trinitarianism. Stop using that phrase. You're not Trini Trinitarians. Sure. It's deceptive to do that. That irks me. You're deceiving people. You're not being forthright. You're taking a term that has an established understanding and then trying to tell people, no, 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 we affirm that. No, you don't. Stop saying that. Own up that you have your own thing. It, it just, sorry, it irks me. But moving along, this also <laughs> comes from the Desire of Ages. Commenting on Jesus' baptism, quote, Remember, folks, barricaded by a thus saith the Lord. That's what this organization believes. I don't care if individual SDAs out there say, oh, I don't believe that. that then get out of this organization that's teaching damnable heresy. Quote, of the vast throng at the Jordan, few except John discern the heavenly vision. Yet the solemnity of the divine presence rested upon the assembly. The people stood silently gazing upon Christ. His form was bathed in the light that ever surrounds the throne of God. His upturned face was glorified as they had never before seen the face of man. From the open heavens, a voice was heard saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. These words of confirmation were given to inspire faith in those who witnessed the scene and to strengthen the Savior for his mission. Notwithstanding that the sins of a guilty world were laid upon Christ, notwithstanding the humiliation of taking upon himself our fallen nature, the voice from heaven declared him to be the son of the eternal. Close quote. So besides erroneously claiming the sins of the world were placed on Christ at his baptism, she says that Jesus took upon himself our fallen nature. There have been arguments for decades over this within Adventism. But notice, Matt, what they said in their 1919 uh, Bible reading for the home circle, which I actually have a physical original copy of. This is essentially the equivalent of an SDA catechism. Quote, in his humanity, Christ partook of our sinful, fallen nature. If not, then he was not made like unto his brethren, was not in all points tempted like we are, did not overcome as we have to overcome and is not therefore the complete and perfect savior man needs and must have to be saved. The idea that Christ was born of an immaculate or sinless mother inherited no tendencies to sin. And for this reason did not sin removes him from the realm of a fallen world. And from the very place where help is needed on his human side, Christ inherited what every child of Adam inherited a sinful nature. Close quote. 
So we will see the larger role that this belief plays in their soteriology in a bit. But notice, Jesus took on the identical nature that fallen man has in every respect. This movement does not teach that having a sinful nature would make you a sinner, only acting upon such, which they say Jesus never did. Jesus supposedly came in a fallen, sinful flesh and didn't sin, which was to demonstrate to the world that the law of God can be kept as a fallen sinner, which silences Satan's accusation in the great controversy, something we will look at next that is foundational to this worldview. But Matt, is that Christian or not? Nah? Well, there's no way that's Christian. <clears throat> You know, I've known that uh, SDA has lots of problems, but I'm really appreciating your uh, research. You're showing me things I didn't even know about. And with this, um, I just have to say that uh, they teach what's called the same thing as uh, Christadelphians. It's another cult. They teach that Jesus had a fallen nature, but he never sinned. So I don't know if the SDA teach that he didn't sin. At this, uh, I'm assuming they don't. So they'd be in bed with the Christadelphians on that. But here's a problem. Jesus came to fulfill the law, Matthew 5, 17. And Matthew 3, 15 is why he was baptized to fulfill all righteousness. To fulfill the law, Deuteronomy 17, 1 says, you shall not sacrifice to the Lord your God an ox or a sheep that has a blemish or any defect of any kind. Now, would you say that having a fallen sinful nature is a defect? Yeah, I would. So uh, this is uh, this is damnable heresy. And uh, the fools who've listened to the, the voice of Satan in their ears and in their hearts have uh, taught this. And the prophecy that Jesus says, Matthew 24, 24, in the last days, many false Christs and many false prophets will arise and deceive many. Uh, this definitely falls under that category. Matt, I hate to break it to you, but it's uh, it's going to get a lot worse. But wait, it's there's gonna more. Get a, it's going to get a lot worse. It's going to get a lot worse. Round three, regarding the fall of man. Now, we're inserting this here for a couple of reasons. Matt, you may not remember this. You probably don't because you talk with thousands of people and it's been about, oh, seven years. Um, so you can rack the filing cabinet of your brain. It's in there somewhere. We talked on the phone. Um, it was during one of your radio broadcasts, and it was about a, 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 this specific subject. And now we're going to get to hear you expound upon this more. So I will be curious to hear your answer. But regarding the fall of man, notice what she writes. I want to preface also by saying that specifically in Patriarchs and Prophets, Ellen, or rather in one of her manuscripts, manuscripts, she states that the first chapter of Patriarchs and Prophets was given to keep people from deception and error. Stephen Bohr mentioned this. We responded to a talk where he was talking about this uh, months ago. This is that chapter. Notice, quote, the serpent plucked the fruit of the forbidden tree and placed it in the hands of the half-reluctant Eve. Then he reminded her of her own words that God had forbidden them to touch it lest they die. She would receive no more harm from eating the fruit he declared them from touching it. Perceiving no evil results from what she had done, Eve grew bolder. When she saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat. It was grateful to the taste, and as she ate, she seemed to feel, feel a vivifying power and imagined herself entering upon a higher state of existence. Without a fear, she plucked and ate, and now, having herself transgressed, she became the agent of Satan in working the ruin of her husband. In a state of strange, unnatural excitement, with her hands filled with the forbidden fruit, she sought his presence and related all that had occurred. Close quote. So in Ellen White's inspired exposition of Genesis, found in Patriarchs and Prophets, Adam and Eve were warned about an angel, that had a powerful foe that had fallen from heaven. An angel warned them of this. And that Eve was not to leave Adam's side, lest this foe come and tempt her. But she did anyways. And after she was tempted alone, she was then used by Satan as a false messenger, they will say to go and tempt and deceive Adam. They actually point to this to say this is an eschatological foreshadowing of the threefold union in the end times of the papacy and Satan and apostate Protestants, etc. to say, oh, the, there was a threefold union there of a serpent, a false messenger, and Satan. Uh, that's the sort of thing that they'll do. But now notice what she also had to say about this event, Matt. Quote, Satan, who is the father of lies, 
deceived Adam in a similar way, telling him that he need not obey God, that he would not die if he transgressed the law. Close quote. So Eve wandered away from Adam supposedly and then was used by Satan as a tool to deceive him as well, both being deceived. Is this Christian or not? Nah? Something stupid. It's definitely not. <laughs> what is I the mean, problem with this? Well, for it one, creates it, serious problems. Oh yeah. Well, they got it from the the uh, Paradise book called. They got it from uh, Second Moronicles, and it's one <laughs> of those apocryphal books next to Deuterectomy. And so, uh, you know, it, it's just it's stupid. It's stupidification. So. Uh, the Bible says in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 4, 6, that you not exceed what's written. This is so critical. The the nature of God's word, you know, God said in Genesis 1, 1, let there be light. There was light. He spoke and it occurred. What God decrees, He it occurs. His speech is one of his attributes and it's a creative work in that he intends it to accomplish what it does. And we've got to believe the word of God and not exceed what's written in it. And all false teachers exceed what's written in the word of God, just like this, this false teacher, Ellen G. White. And um, oh, I just remembered something. I'm going to talk to you about this after the show. Somebody I know who has a lot of books. Uh, that's another topic. You don't, you don't have to remind me. Uh, at any rate, so this is not biblical. Uh, her hands filled with the forbidden fruit. She thought his presence related everything. Uh, it just says she gave it to Adam, and then he ate. That's all it says. Um, well, not just that, but Genesis Genesis 3, 6 specifically says Adam was with her. He yeah, well, with here's her. Yes, there's a debate about that because, see, my wife right now is with me in our house, but yeah. she can't hear me speaking. So that's why, you know, I'm, I'm critical uh, because I, I really try and think of minutia. And so with her, yes, what does that mean? Within earshot, did he watch the certain the serpent do this and, and why didn't he step in then? Or was he with her in the garden at 30 feet away, 40 feet away, 100 feet away, et cetera? So that's why I say we can't say too much about that. But I definitely get it. And uh, it, it's just exceeding what's written in the word of God. Uh, I mean, come on. How can these SDAs not see this this stupidity what this is? Well, that's the same question. How can the Mormons not see it and the Roman Catholics? Because they're not regenerate. Uh, because they're not saved. You see, the thing is that the word of God uh, is what we depend on. The word of God is what teaches us. And the regenerate person listens to the word of God. They listen to the voice of Christ. Jesus says, my, my sheep hear my voice and they follow after me and I give eternal life to them. John 10, 27, 28. So the true sheep are going to go after his voice. False sheep go after a different shepherd. She's a false shepherd. And the SDA who follow her and believe her are, are not true converts. They're false shepherd. They're false believers or false sheep. And they're following uh, her to the abyss. They need to, to repent. They need to stop. They need the whole SDA church needs to be needs to stop. They need to stop. It's it's a cult. Okay. It's false. Yeah. yeah and there's there's issues there around headship, which again they don't affirm. Um but saying but well and, and saying that Adam was deceived when um Paul seems to quite explicitly say in multiple places uh that Adam was not too. De right. yeah, was not deceived. Um and the fact that uh it's rooted in the created order and, and headship and, and these sorts of things. So it creates problems on that front as well. Now we're going to transition into round four, which is the big one, Matt, the Adventist salvation model rounds four and five mean, are going to be connected. It gets worse. Wow. It gets worse. It, it gets, gets worse. worse. Wow. Matt, I, I, I want you to utilize our website, uh, I will be in in any way that you can because you like. I just primary take source. all your stuff. Just take it from my site. I'm kidding. You will be <laughs> able to go on there, Matt. I don't know anyone else in the space that has this much uh, primary source documentation no, already do. organized for you. I, we're talking thousands of primary source documents. You know, going through and reading archives and these sorts of things. Okay. But nevertheless. The Adventist salvation model. So to look at this, we have to examine some of the SDA pre-earth origin story because the Adventist gospel centers around the belief that Jesus's exaltation in heaven led to Lucifer becoming jealous, rebelling, and attacking God's law, by which they mean the Ten Commandments. 
The Adventist plan of salvation then involves Jesus incarnating, leaving his exalted status, and demonstrating that Satan's accusations are false. The entire thing centers around the heavenly trio having to vindicate their characters from Satan's accusations. So this is foundational to their system. So to start, quote, patriarchs and prophets. From the first, the great controversy had been upon the law of God. Satan had sought to prove that God was unjust, that his law was faulty, and that the good of the universe required it to be changed. In attacking the law, he aimed to overthrow the authority of its author. In the controversy, it was to be shown whether the divine statutes were defective and subject to change or perfect and immutable. Stated even more plainly in Lift Him Up, quote, Christ left his position in the heavenly courts and came to this earth to live the life of human beings. This sacrifice he made in order to show that Satan's charge against God is false and that it is possible for man to obey the law of, or the laws of God's kingdom. Close quote. So Jesus incarnated to silence accusations from Satan that God's law isn't fair, can't be kept, etc. That's what the Adventist worldview centers around and why they place such a heavy emphasis on the law. It all goes back to this pre-earth origin story. Matt, does the Bible know anything about a pre-earth origin story of Satan accusing God's law because of Jesus being exalted, etc.? No, that, that's horrible. It's similar to Mormonism, though, because in Mormonism, there's a pre-existence where Father, uh, God the Father had sex with his goddess wife and produced offspring. Jesus is the firstborn, yep. and then the devil and all the, all of us born. And then there was a plan of salvation offered by Jesus and the Father and uh, Satan. The Father went with Jesus' plan, and so uh, there was uh, a rebellion. But this is uh, there's n there's no biblical foundation to it. She's making it up. And uh, it's it's well, I think the more I'm, I'm seeing this, the more I'm thinking she's demonically inspired, that there's a demonic connection there. I'd like to know about her early life and if, if she's involved in the occult at all. But nevertheless, uh, this is demonic stuff. I can get you materials on that. Um, I, I, I can get you a lot of materials on that. She had a green cord that this angel told her to keep down at her bosom and that anytime that she needed to see or, or wanted to see Jesus and have an interaction with him, she could take that green cord and place it on her stomach. I, we don't want to sidetrack on that, but I can get you any sort of details on that. I can also get you any sort of details that you want around. Uh, we've talked about this on the platform. We're getting ready to do a stream on this with the cultish guys over at uh, Apologia Studi uh, Studios. Shout out to them. We're going to be talking about the SDA Mormon connection, specifically the plan of salvation, because you hit the nail on the head there, Matt. Um, there's roughly 12 parallels that I've identified. They both believe Jesus is Michael the Archangel. Uh, Lucifer became jealous because Jesus was exalted and brought into these councils that Satan was barred from. They then both uh, claim that Lucifer began attacking eternal laws, etc. Uh, the Father accepted a plan that Jesus presented to the Father to essentially save, etc. They both have uh, God essentially having a body ontologically and then being three distinct beings, etc. So, the pre-earth uh, plan of salvation. Now, this is what supposedly happened after the fall of man in the garden. So in this worldview, Satan tempted Adam and Eve. They fell, and God the Father held a council meeting to discuss the plan to save man. This is from the chapter titled The Plan of Salvation in Ellen White's book, Spirit of Prophecy. Quote, Sorrow filled heaven as it was realized that man was lost and the world that God created was to be filled with mortals doomed to misery, sickness, and death, and there was no way of escape for the offender. The whole family of Adam must die. I saw the lovely Jesus and beheld an expression of sympathy and sorrow upon his countenance. Soon I saw him approach the exceeding bright light which enshrouded the Father. Said my accompanying angel, he is in close converse with his Father. The anxiety of the angels seemed to be intense while Jesus was communing with his father. Three times he was shut in by the glorious light about the father, and the third time he came from the father his person could be seen. His countenance was calm, free from all perplexity and trouble, and shone with benevolence and loveliness such as words cannot express. He then made known to the angelic host that a way of escape had been made for lost man. He told them that he had been pleading with his father. 
and had offered to give his life a ransom and take the sentence of death upon himself, that through him man might find pardon, that through the merits of his blood and obedience to the law of God, they could have the favor of God and be brought into the beautiful garden and eat of the fruit of the tree of life. Close quote. So part of the SDA plan of salvation is that man can be reconciled to God, brought into his favor through Christ's merits, plus obedience to the law. Jesus had to propose a plan to the Father, and after three tries, the Father accepted the plan. Because now notice, two pages later, quote, Jesus bade the heavenly host be reconciled to the plan that his Father accepted and rejoice that fallen man could be exalted again through his death to obtain favor with God and enjoy heaven. Close quote. So, Matt, the infamous question, is this Christian or not? Nah? Uh, it's satanic doctrine. That's what it is. Why is this satanic doctrine? Because it's adding works to salvation. Now, if you go to, uh, you know, Romans 3.28, we maintain yeah, we maintain that man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Romans 4, 5, but to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. You can go to Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. You should study those. Those who are seeking to be justified by the law, you've been severed from Christ. From Christ. Sever, uh, justified by the law, they were talking about circumcision, you've been severed from Christ. And uh, so it's a damnable heresy to add to the work of Christ on the cross. One of the illustrations I use when I'm talking to people about this kind of a thing, as, as I say, if you don't mind me taking this, it, it's powerful. It, it works with a lot of people. Uh, I talk to Roman Catholics, uh, Eastern Orthodox about this, and I try and get them to understand what they're doing. And I say, look, let's imagine this. Uh, that there's a, a hill, it's a dirty hill, a slight uh, in, a slope. And on top of this hill is the cross, and Jesus is up on that cross, and his blood is coming down from his body, the beaten, broken body that he has that is mixing in the dirt below on the ground. And you are on your knees before this cross, and you don't even want to look up. You're not even worthy to look up, and you're before the cross. That's the place of salvation. And yet you hear from behind you, you hear a man on his hands and knees slowly crawling towards that cross slowly approaching that cross through the mire the the gunk the crap all that's there he passes you by slowly his head's down low he's humble before god and he crawls up to the cross and then what he does is he reaches into his pocket he pulls out a list of his deeds a list of the things that he's done uh and is keeping the law loving god loving your neighbor being honest being truthful whatever it is and he just presses it and nails it right there to that cross and he backs away with humility. And what he's hoping is that God the Father will accept him based on what Jesus did and what he does. And that's what these people are doing. They don't realize it's from the, the pit of hell. It's demonic doctrine. I can't say it any more clearly. It's from the pit of hell. It is satanic in its origin. It is satanic in its goal. And so we have to understand that Jesus Christ, God in flesh, died on the cross, rose from the dead. Only through him can we be saved. In fact, the faith that we have that's in him, we're justified by faith, Romans 5.1. The faith that we have is granted to us by God, Philippians 1.29. And that faith is in Christ. It's the work of God, John 6.29. God gives us everything we need because Jesus, God in flesh, did everything that we need. He never broke the law, 1 Peter 2.22. He fulfilled everything perfectly, completely, and totally. And all we have to do is put our faith and our trust in Lord Jesus Christ and the devil. All he's got to do is just to get you to sincerely try and add to what Christ has done, thereby denying the sufficiency of the cross in and of itself. And hence, this is a demonic doctrine. And Ellen G. White, if she has not repented, is in the fires of hell right now. Matt, you mentioned justification there and sanctification and uh, not being justified uh, or being justified apart from works of the law. That was a perfect segue because now we're going to get into that somewhat. <clears throat> Notice now, in this same vein, uh, the infamous, infamous Testimonies for the Church, Volume 4, quote, Man who has defaced the image of God in his soul by a corrupt life cannot by mere human effort affect a radical change in himself. He must accept the provisions of the gospel. Oh, what are those? He must be reconciled to God through obedience to his law 
and faith in Jesus Christ. His life from thenceforth must be governed by a new principle. Through repentance, faith, and good works, he may perfect a righteous character and claim through the merits of Christ the privileges of the sons of God. Close quote. So Adventists will insist that they are not sinless perfectionists, but yes, they are. Here we plainly see she teaches that faith in Christ and obedience to the law reconcile a person to God. This is what the SDA church teaches. Not that obedience is a fruit of already being reconciled, but that your faith empowers you to do something you couldn't do before. That's the provisions of the gospel that she mentions. And through your obedience and diligent efforts, you'll gradually be made more and more righteous through Christ, imparting his righteousness to you in small little bits, not imputation, impartation. And yes, I'm aware SDAs out there that Ellen White sometimes use the term imputation. The point is, like with everything else, she doesn't define that the way that it's understood prior to the SDAs being around, yet they'll try and assert, no, 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 we mean the same thing. No, they do not. Eventually, a person will get to a point where they are as righteous as Jesus and mirror his character perfectly, which is necessary in this system, as I will show later. But Matt, man is reconciled to God through faith and obedience to the law. Christian or not? Nah? It's not Christian at all. I'm <laughs> all right. So I'm going to read you guys something. This is a quote from the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. 1983, page 12. Um, February 15th, many have found the second requirement for salvation more difficult. It is to obey God's laws, just to conform one's life to the moral requirements set out in the Bible. The Book of Mormon, 3rd Nephi 19, uh, no, actually not 3rd Nephi 1918, it's 2nd uh, Nephi 25, 23. You're saved by grace through faith after all you can do. In uh, the, count, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 2068, it says that uh, you obtain salvation through faith, baptism, and the observance of the commandments. So you can see, and then I can get into e Eastern Orthodoxy as well. They teach the, a very similar thing. So all false religious systems add works to the finished work of Christ because he, ultimately what they're doing is saying that what Jesus did in the cross is not sufficient to save you of your sins. So it's a demonic gospel. And if you're an SDA, listen to me. You have to understand something that... Uh, I've been studying theology since 1980. I've debated thousands of people, and I've had thousands of hours of discussions and teachings. It doesn't mean I'm right. I mean, my last name is Slick. You can't trust me. you got to be careful. But this is what I know. What I know for a fact. I know what uh, cults teach, and I've been called by God to do this. That's another story. And let me just tell you that Ellen G. White was a false teacher. And if you're putting your heart, heart and hope in her, then all you have to do, it's not a big deal. All you could do is just step to the left and go into Roman Catholicism and just put the same devotion to Mary because Mary in their devotions, she has the authority to be able to confer upon us the wisdom of the ages through the son, Jesus Christ. So they do this, they exalt someone other than Jesus Christ. And this is what's happening with Ellen G. White. Uh, the Bible says, Jesus said, Luke 16, 16, the law and the prophets were until John. John was the last of, of the true prophets. A New Testament prophets, 1 Corinthians 14, talks about those who prophesy, and, and then that must be done in church context. It's a charismatic gift. We can get into that. But the thing is that Ellen G. White, I'm sorry, she's a false teacher. She was a false teacher, taught a false God, false Christ, well, yeah, false Christ, and a false gospel. And if you die believing in what uh, she has taught, you're going to go to hell. And I don't want that for you. You need to come to Christ. And I can give you a gospel message, very simple, right out of scriptures that you can affirm all the way and uh, turn your heart to Christ, not to uh, SDA. Well, and see, Matt, they're going to, uh, so many of them are going to tell you, no, no, see, I don't, I don't even read Ellen White. You hardly ever hear Ellen White mentioned, but she's so integral in the system. If you remember that GI Butler quote, she is her writings are the keystone to the arch. Yeah. You remove that, the whole thing falls. Fundamental belief number 18. They believe that she had the gift of prophecy. What they mean by that is the identifying mark of the remnant church. Jesus was manifest in her writings, speaking through her writings, which they believe identifies them as God's last day people. You throw her out, you're no longer the remnant church. Oh, you're not the remnant church anymore? Your whole system collapses. They have to have her she is the keystone to the arch. So if you are in SDA, please listen and heed Matt's warning. Here you go, Matt, in the same vein of what you were just saying. Quote, will man take hold of divine power and with determination 
and perseverance resists Satan as Christ has given him example in his conflict with the foe in the wilderness of temptation. God cannot save man against his will from the power of Satan's artifices. Man must work with his human power, aided by the divine power of Christ, to resist and to conquer at any cost to himself. In short, man must overcome as Christ overcame. And then, through the victory that is his privilege to gain by the all-powerful name of Jesus, he may become an heir of God and joint heir with Jesus Christ. This could not be the case if Christ alone did all the overcoming. Man must do his part. He must be victor on his own account through the strength and grace that Christ gives him. Man must be a co-worker with Christ in the labor of overcoming, and then he will be partaker with Christ in his glory. Close quote. It is like synergism on steroids, Matt. It's not just... An inconsistent, you know, individuals, you know, that that doesn't realize, you know, they, they're truly trusting in Christ. You know, this is flat mm -hmm. out. No, it is a dual effort. It is a dual effort. And they're going to come back to you with on this and say, what are the, the, the consistent SDA that believes this system and this this quote? They're going to come back to you and say, well, you just don't believe Jesus is powerful enough to free you from sin completely. You don't, they're going to point to, she just saying that you should be victorious over sin. You're what's wrong with that. Those are the sort of things that they're going to say. What are the key issues with this quote? Well, there she's denying justification by faith alone in Christ alone, that you have to keep the law, be obedient in order to be saved. This works righteousness. So it says, uh, the gain, the all powerful name, uh, man must do his part he must be victor on his own account man must be co-worker with christ in the labor of overcoming and he'll be be a made partaker of the christ this is the same stuff that that uh, catholicism teaches um earlier when you you know you said that uh, uh the quote he must be reconciled to god through obedience to his law and faith in jesus christ through repentance faith and good works he may perfect a righteous character that's you know uh testimonies of the church volume four page 294 okay so that uh, that is a false gospel. And what I'm really kind of impressed to say is if they claim to be the remnant church of the truth, not like the present system, then why are they so much alike with the Roman Catholic system? Yeah, they it's, have a medieval. medieval. Yeah, their, their soteriology is medieval. Yeah, um, it's, and, it's false. It's false doctrine. Well, and the irony of it is that they uh, they don't. <laughs> You know, Adventists tend to point to Roman Catholics as like the boogeyman of like all of society, <laughs> the whole world, and yet can't even see that their soteriology is literally a, a medieval scholastic soteriology of grace being an infused, um, like an infused righteousness gradually over time. You mentioned justification. Well, here we are on justification now, Matt. Quote. While God can be just and yet justify the sinner through the merits of Christ, no man can cover his soul with the garments of Christ's righteousness while practicing known sins or neglecting known duties. God requires the entire surrender of the heart before justification can take place. And in order for man to retain justification, there must be continual obedience through active living faith that works by love and purifies the soul. Close quote. So they teach a two-tiered system of justification. You are initially justified by your faith in Christ. And that wouldn't be possible if Christ, you know, didn't, did, you know, if there wasn't, they, they essentially affirm provenient grace. Oh, so it is all of grace, that initial justification. But your final justification, what their theologians will call eschatological justification, that is to be determined based on your obedience and if you attain to a perfect developed character. Because notice, this is from one of their, their, he's a professor emeritus now, but he was a professor at their seminary, Seventh Adventist Theological Seminary, Peter Van Bemelen, from a paper, Justification by Faith and Adventist Understanding. Bit of a quote here. Notice, if our justification is through grace alone by faith alone, does the obedience of faith have anything to do with our salvation? Or to phrase the question differently, do our thoughts, words, and actions play a role in determining our eternal destiny? These are crucial, crucial questions which are closely related to the issue of the final judgment. 
Scripture has much to say about that judgment, not, le not least in the teachings of our Lord as recorded in the Gospels. Said Jesus, I tell you that men will have to give account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. Here our Lord talks about justification and condemnation, the judicial declarations of innocence and guilt, in the context of the day of judgment. Obviously, there is an eschatological aspect to justification. Adventists believe on the basis of Scripture that the day of judgment is a very comprehensive concept and much Adventist literature has been published on the subject. Close quote. So that is their scholarly way of saying that they believe justification is a two-tier system. Yet in the same paper, the gentleman opens by saying Adventists are heirs of the Reformation. <laughs> they try to argue, like one of their scholars, Roy Gain, did in a paper I have. I'll have a video coming out on this uh, in a couple months, probably. He tries to argue that Luther and Calvin believed justification and sanctification were tied together. Not that both happen in the life of the believer, but that sanctification produces an increase in justification, leading to what Peter Van Bemmelen here calls eschatological justification. Matt, is this Christian or nah? It's Roman Catholic. It's not Christian. That actually, what they're teaching is Roman Catholic uh, soteriology. Uh, I'm really amazed at how uh, identical it is. Because in Roman Catholicism, in paragraph 1999, grace is infused into the soul. When you're baptized, all of your original uh, sin is removed. And if you die right there, you go to heaven. But if you lust a little bit, do something bad, part of your grace that was in your soul is lost. That's uh, by venial sin. So you have to do good things and keep the law, do sacraments and things like that in order to be get your grace reinfused into your soul. That's why it says in paragraph 2068 that uh, you have to uh, you obtain salvation through faith, baptism, and the observance of the commandments. In paragraph 2036, it says that uh, keeping the natural law is necessary for salvation. And paragraph 2070, the natural law is the Ten Commandments. So you have to keep the Ten Commandments to be saved. So, I mean, I'm not seeing anything different here than uh, what the Roman Catholic teaches, but uh, from what she teaches. And to say that justification is increased by our action is foolishness. In Romans 4, 1 through 5, which we go over, teaches that uh, the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. And all false religious systems, all false religious systems teach that justification is something that you can improve, increase, and do to get more of whatever uh, uh, you gain, regain, or you, know, you attain, maintain, and regain justification through your efforts, your baptism, your commandment keeping, and everything. It's all false gospel. And uh, this, these guys are not Christians teaching this. These people are not Christians. You can't call them brothers in Christ. They're false teachers. They're not Christians teaching this stuff. Plus, well, I'm telling you, the irony of, like, they, they claim... <laughs> All these boogeymen about, you know, Rome changed the Ten Commandments, the Pope changed the Sabbath, all these sorts of conspiracies. And it's like, dude, do you not even see that your soteriology is like literally scholastic medieval soteriology? Yeah. <laughs> like to a, to a T, <laughs> you, you literally have like, and again, they'll try and, and say, well, Luther and Calvin, uh, they believed in, in the same sort of idea, which is just shameful. Like this scholar, Roy Gain, he tries to, to cite Calvin's Institutes. <laughs> Book three. And I'm thinking, I'm like, dude, in that literal chapter, he's arguing against the exact thing that you're claiming that he, he was holding to. It's just crazy. Well, you know, I went to a Lutheran college and took all of their theology courses, all of them, and loved everything. They don't teach what they're saying Lutheranism says. I went to a no. Calvinist seminary. And so Lutheran college, Calvinist Presbyterian seminary, they're totally misrepresenting both Lutheranism and Calvinism here. It's not what yeah. yeah, they try to appeal to early Luther. And I don't know how familiar you are with the different schools, the different Lutheran schools. But there, there is a there is a modern wing of, of, of the Lutheran scholastics that are trying to say that early Luther did affirm something like that. Well, this gentleman in his paper, he tries to appeal to that wing of, of individuals. But that group of people that he's appealing to are notoriously known for trying to rewrite Lutheran history. So it's not necessarily the. Uh, the best people to appeal to. Now you're going to hear what they teach about sanctification. Quote, 
Christ has repeatedly shown that his father's law contains something deeper than mere authoritative commands. In the law is embodied the same principle that is revealed in the gospel. The law points out man's duty to, to, and shows him his guilt. To Christ, he must look for pardon and for power to do what the law enjoins. So you're just talking about Lutheranism. There is no law gospel distinction here. The law and the gospel contain the same principle in Adventism. The law points a person to Christ, showing their own deficiency, and by being pointed to Christ, the perfect law keeper, he's the great example, you're pointed back to the law and shown the standard of attaining salvation. Notice, quote, when it is the heart, to, uh, when it is in the heart to obey God, when efforts are put forth to this end, Jesus accepts the disposition and effort as man's best service, and he makes up for the deficiency with his own divine merit. Close quote. So their sanctification model looks like this. A person comes to Christ and all of their past sins are forgiven. Past sins. They get a clean slate. If they've truly come to Christ, they will begin or they will be given the power to now keep the law. But obviously perfection takes time. So as you're going along, Jesus makes up where you fall short with his own divine merits. Eventually, you get to a place where you no longer need this because you have developed a perfect character that mirrors Christ's, which is what they mean when they use the phrase righteousness by faith. One has to get to this condition before the close of probation, or they won't make it through the time of trouble. So yes, Adventists, this is central to the system. You can't reject this. It's part of the whole kit and caboodle. We're going to see this even further, but before getting there, Matt, Christian or nah? Not Christian. <clears throat> Why is it not Christian? Well, it doesn't hold to biblical theology, but what it does hold to is Eastern Orthodox theosis. Eastern Orthodoxy split away, or if you want to call it, split away from Catholicism or Catholicism from Eastern Orthodoxy in 1054. But uh, Eastern Orthodoxy teaches that you obtain justification through the theosis. It's the energies of God or the grace of God that works in you through a, a life of sanctification by which you then become more and more justified and Christ-like. And theosis is uh, becoming Christ-like and becoming Christ-ish. And it's kind of hard to explain. They don't say you're deified, but they call it deification. So they're everything that Christ is supposed to be without being divine. And so this is the same kind of a thing that I'm I'm hearing uh, from, from what you're saying here. So this is definitely cult theology. Uh, I'm really kind of entertained by how the Rome. I mean, uh, I've known that Eastern uh, Seventh-day Adventism has just snotted all over Roman Catholicism, but I'm just tickled. <laughs> they, 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 they are so Roman Catholic in their soteriology and in their sanctification. They are so Eastern Orthodox. Uh, so they are just like the ones that they condemn, mock, and say are not true. And they don't even realize how bad their theology is. Wow. I say it all the time, Matt. I say it on the platform all the time. Yep. And SDA is constantly telling me, you don't know what you're talking about. You, this. I'm telling you, folks, you're not just hearing this from me. I'm telling you, like, you know, and, and this platform, we don't typically focus on. We're, we're focused on Adventism, obviously. but I, I try and point these things out for the sake of saying they're not heirs of the Reformation. They need to stop saying that. They need to stop deceiving people. They need to stop lying. And I'm glad, Matt, that you have the sort of same energy that I do, that this is damnable heresy. <laughs> this is damnable heresy. This isn't like, well, you know, you think it, it, we should have a guitar in the worship service and, and you, don't. you don't. No, this yeah. is damnable heresy. If a person believes this, they're lost, they're not saved, they don't know the gospel, they have a false God, and they need to repent, and they need to turn away from their idol, they need to turn away from their comfortability, they need to come out from this organization, all the SDAs, who say, oh, well, I know the true gospel, and I know the, the Orthodox Trinity, and I, I reject the other step. Well, then why are you remaining in an organization that is under the curse of God, 
Galatians 1, 6 through 9 says, Anyone that preaches a false gospel, whether it be an angel from heaven or three angels from heaven, who preaches a different gospel is actively under the curse of God. Why would you want to be a part of an organization that's under the curse of God? As if it couldn't get any worse, Matt. Round five, the Adventist atonement model. Buckle up. I hope your office chair has a seat belt because this, I'm sorry, it works me up. It is blasphemous heresy, what we're about to look at. The game is over. We're not doing the sounds anymore because we already know the answers at this point. Regarding the Adventist view of atonement, Matt, the SDA church does not believe that the atonement is finished. It is a long, drawn-out process that actually involves the second coming, their threefold view of judgment, so the pre-advent investigative judgment, uh, the millennial reign judgment, the post-millennial judgment, as well as the sins of those found worthy being transferred to Satan. First, notice what their fundamental beliefs, number 24, says on the investigative judgment and the heavenly sanctuary. I'm going to read the full belief here. Quote, There is a sanctuary in heaven, the true tabernacle that the Lord set up and not humans. In it, Christ ministers on our behalf, making available to believers the benefits of his atoning sacrifice offered once for all on the cross. At his ascension, he was inaugurated as a great high priest and began his intercessory ministry, which was typified by the work of the high priest in the holy place of the earthly sanctuary. In 1844, at the end of the prophetic period of 2,300 days, he entered the second and last phase of his atoning ministry, which was typified by the work of the high priest in the most holy place of the earthly sanctuary. It is a work of investigative judgment, which is part of the ultimate disposition of all sin, typified by the cleansing of the ancient Hebrew sanctuary on the Day of Atonement. In that typical service, the sanctuary was cleansed with the blood of animals or with the blood of animal sacrifices, but the heavenly things are purified with the perfect sacrifice of the blood of Christ. The investigative judgment reveals to heavenly intelligences who among the dead are asleep in Christ and therefore in him are deemed worthy to have part in the first resurrection. It also makes manifest who among the living are abiding in Christ, keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, and in him, therefore, are ready for translation into his everlasting kingdom. This judgment vindicates the justice of God in saving those who believe in Jesus. It declares that those who have remained loyal to God shall receive the kingdom. The completion of this ministry of Christ will mark the close of human probation before the second advent. Close quote. So like I mentioned earlier, their theology centers around the heavenly trio having to vindicate their character from Satan's accusations. So the investigative judgment is part of that. Notice that they say it is a part of the ultimate disposition of sin. We will look at this more closely in a moment. But the investigative judgment is the second phase of the atonement, and Jesus was supposedly inaugurated as a priest at his ascension. Matt, is that what the Bible teaches? No way. Jesus was uh, a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, Hebrews 620 and 725. And when he was baptized, that's when he entered into the priesthood. Jesus says in Matthew 315, uh, John said, you know, he, he said, Jesus, you should baptize me. And he says, no, let us fulfill all righteousness, fulfill Old Testament. I've written an article on this. Why was Jesus baptized? But the basic story is this, that in order to enter into the priesthood, you had to be 30 years of age. Jesus was 30. Had oil uh, put upon you, which is the Holy Spirit. The uh, they had to have a verbal, verbal blessing given, my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Had to be sprinkled with water. That's what uh, I believe Jesus was sprinkled because of that, right out of Levitical law. And uh, <clears throat> the chapters you want to look at for this in the Old Testament are Leviticus chapter 8, Numbers chapter 4, and Exodus 29. He entered into the priesthood at his baptism. And uh, there is no uh, issue here at his, uh, his resurrection ascension. He became a high priest. That, that's ridiculous. Because you had to be uh, in, in the position to make an atonement, which is finished on the cross, to tell us die, John 19.30, it is finished and uh it's a finish of the legal aspect of the requirements of the law. Jesus canceled the sin debt at the cross, Colossians 2.14. Having canceled the certificate of debt consisting of decrees, which is hostile to us, he took it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. That's when the atonement was finished. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
hold on one sec, clear my throat. That's when the atonement was finished, not when he ascended, and he's not finishing it up in heaven now. So what the SDA uh, heretic is teaching here is that uh, the atonement of Christ was not completed on the cross when Jesus said it was. The atonement is not sufficient in and of itself to atone for us and redeem us, and it was. And they're saying that Jesus became a high priest, not at his baptism, which is the biblical position, but at an ascension. So uh, this is this is the phenomena where one heresy leads to another, to another, to another. And the more you get into their heresies, the more problems you're going to find. It's one of the reasons I like to ask questions, very detailed questions of people that I debate to find out what the specifics are. Because only the Christian, Christian Trinitarian view is coherent. All other views fall apart. All you got to do is find the holes. If you know your theology, you can do that. But nevertheless, uh, this is just teaching more heresies, uh, more false teachings. And I, I mean, there's a lot more here we could talk about, but it's it's bad. It's really bad. <clears throat> yeah, you're muted. Sorry about that. I said brace yourself because, Matt, what they teach regarding Colossians 2 is that the handwriting of ordinances, they're going to want to quote from the King James, is talking about the ceremonial law being nailed oh, to the cross. Let's do it. Yeah. They don't understand. So, And I've listened okay. to you on this a lot, that this is a hopox and that this is chirographon is a legal term and that it's, it's dealing with legal indebtedness and yeah. et cetera. Well, Buckle up here because here you go. Let's look at some of the fuller details around this atonement now. Matt, the infamous patriarchs and prophets quote, folks, quote, the blood of Christ, while it was to release the repentant sinner from the condemnation of the law, was not to cancel the sin. It would stand on record in the sanctuary until the final atonement. So in the type, the blood of the sin offering removed the sin from the penitent, but it rested in the sanctuary until the day of atonement. Close quote. No sins were canceled at Calvary. It was only where the atoning sacrifice took place. This is how they will bamboozle people, Matt. And I'm not saying they necessarily always are doing this being knowingly deceptive, but they will say, if you ask, for example, was the atonement complete at the cross? Oftentimes I will hear, yes, the atoning sacrifice took place at the cross. Not that the atonement was complete at the cross. Christ's blood functions as a transference mechanism to transfer sin to a heavenly sanctuary building in heaven where it stands on record and is being investigated in the investigative judgment where Jesus will look to see who is and isn't worthy of having their sins blotted out. But in line with this, you had SDA pioneers such as Uriah Smith, who was an anti-Trinitarian heretic, saying stuff like this, which the SDA church has yet to denounce. The death of Christ and the atonement are not the same thing. And this relieves all matter of or and this relieves matter of all difficulty. Christ did not make atonement when he shed his blood upon the cross. Let this fact be fixed forever in the mind. Close quote. Matt, what do you think when you read something like this? This is in their church paper, folks. Church paper. Not some obscure whatever. Not some obscure individual. One of the individuals involved in systematizing SDA theology. The SDA church today will try and say, oh, no, we've changed since that. We now believe their scholars will use this uh, uh, euphemism of we believe in a completed, incomplete atonement. Well, Uriah Smith is uh, listening to the same demonic angelic source as Joseph Smith. Uh, it's clear to me that uh, these guys couldn't argue their way out of a wet paper bag. They don't know their theology. They don't know the scriptures. And they are in service of the enemy of the gospel. They're teaching a false gospel. They're teaching darkness. They're teaching a damnable heresy. So <clears throat> Colossians 2.14, having canceled out the certificate of debt, this Greek word is kerographon, a single uh, word, and it means handwritten IOU of legal indebtedness. Some people say that it's the law, ceremonial law, that was canceled. Nothing in the scripture there says that it, it, that's what it is, because the previous verse says that uh, G in verse 13 says, having uh, forgiven us all of our transgressions, having canceled the certificate of debt. So the certificate of debt is related to the, the uh, transgressions. Furthermore, sin is breaking the law of God, 1 John 3, 4. So sin is a legal problem, not only legal, but it's a legal problem. Jesus said in John 
excuse me, Matthew 6, 12, in a parallel of Luke uh, 4, our Father who art in heaven, forgive us our debts, forgive us our sins. So Jesus re equates sin with legal debt. And kerographon in the Greek, in Colossians 2, 14, is a certificate of debt. And uh, I certainly believe and will teach and affirm that that is the, the debt of the of the, the sin of the individuals. And it was accomplished at the cross. It's another demonic teaching to deny the sufficiency of the cross of Christ. Uh, at that point. And now if someone wants to say it's a ceremonial law that was uh, canceled at the cross, if that's the case, then why is the ceremonial aspect of the law and intercession still going on from the SDA perspective in the heavenly sanctuary? So that would be a question I'd like to ask them. Uh, Mr. I, they probably go, oh, I never thought of that. But uh, maybe they have. I don't know. So if it's the law that was canceled, you can't separate the ceremonial because the law by Christ is all the same law. It's all of it. That is how the law is spoken of, 613 commandments. So if you want to say that the law is, is um, canceled in any way, shape or form, you have a problem because in Romans 5.13, it says without the law, there is no sin. The transgression of the law, there is no sin. So the SDA have a huge problem. Colossians 2.14, in my opinion, is one of the most powerful verses in the entire Bible to teach proper biblical theology. Because it necessitates that the atoning sacrifice was finished at the cross as a propitiatory sacrifice, which we can get into and why that is the case. It accomplished what God desired for it to be accomplished. It does not rest in the heart and the hand of man to be able to finish what God did. This is the foolishness of the devil himself who speaks to his servants on earth to say that the cross of Christ, the blood of God on the cross, Acts 20, 28, does not sufficient in and of itself to buy us from uh and redeem us from our sinful damnation that is due to us by our nature and by our, our sins. No, you have to do something. You've got to add to it because what he did was not quite enough. And we, pat yourself on the back, are good enough to be able to add to that, to do what we do by our works, by whatever it is. And the stupidity of the um, the investigative judgment that's going to say that that's where your works are being inv uh, investigated to see if they're worthy or not. It's foolishness. And one of the reasons it is because the Trinitarian communion, God knows all things from eternity. He works all things from the counsel of his will. Ephesians 1.11. He knows whom he has called. He knows which sins to impute to Christ. He knows exactly what he's doing. He doesn't have to look into the future, look into some investigative judgment to see if you're worthy or not. Nobody's worthy. We certainly don't get a salvation by what we do, our sincerity, or anything. We are we are justified by faith apart from the works of the law, and the works of the law are summarized by Jesus in Matthew 12, uh, 22, 37 through 40. Love God, love your neighbor, and these two commandments are all the law, is quoting Deuteronomy 6, 5 and Leviticus 19, 18, respectively. And Paul the Apostle says we're justified by faith apart from the works of the law, loving God and loving your neighbor. You don't have to do those things first in order to get saved. You're saved because God regenerates you, because he grants you faith. Philippians 1.29 causes you to be born again. 1 Peter 1.3, you're born again, not of your own will. John 1.13, the faith that you have is in Christ Jesus. John 6.29, he grants you repentance. 2 Timothy 2.25, you come to him because it's granted that you come to him. In John 6.65, and as many as had been appointed to, to eternal life believed, Acts 13.48. Uh, it's the work of God, but what people do in the false religious systems is they take the authority of God, the work of God, the sovereignty of God, the sacrifice of God, they rip it out of its context in heaven, out of the very heart and work of God himself, they put it in their own hands, and then they say, this is what I have to do to make myself right with the infinitely holy God. They're fools, they're the children of the devil, they need to repent, they need to stop believing that lie, and I would be glad to debate your best SDA people on this, on your planet, I'd be glad to debate them anytime on it because they are flaming heretics and this doctrine it leads to eternal damnation and that's why i hate what i hate because of this kind of stuff because i've been in the presence of the lord jesus christ i know what it means to be in his holiness and his presence and i know what it means to read the fools who teach this crap and this idiocy that they have to add to the finished work of jesus christ and say that it was not finished at the cross that you and your foolishness, and your arrogance, and your pride have got to continue and finish what he did, and you are going to somehow make it. Then you will be, as Jesus says in Matthew 7, 22 and 23, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name? In your name, cast out demons, perform many miracles. And that means they were believers, and look at all the good stuff that they did. And he said, get away from me. I never knew you, you workers of evil. Why? Because what are they appealing to for their salvation on the day of judgment? Their faith and their works. And this is why they're damned. I could go on and on and on, but it's your show.
Well, Matt, they are, there's a lot there that I, I just, I know what their responses will be. So with the investigative judgment, they're going to tell you, well, God's not learning anything in the investigative judgment. Again, it all goes back to, as you saw in the fundamental belief, it's about God vindicating his character against Satan's accusations. The investigative judgment is one of the steps by which God has chosen in the plan of salvation. He has a seven step program and it's called the sanctuary. Now, we're not going to get off into all this because this would Can be I just a comment whole... on that. Yeah. The foolishness of that statement to vindicate his character against the devil. Where yeah. do you get that? It's not in the Bible. There's no God doesn't vindicate himself or justify himself to anybody. So what they're doing is they're saying God is not God. He needs to prove himself to the demonic realm. That's foolishness. Oh. And it's foundational oh. to the whole system, Matt. It's foundational to their whole system. You have SDA organizations out there that their tagline is vindicating the character of God. The SDA church thinks part of their duty what? as God's people is to go out into the world and basically be the soap that cleans the character of God that people from the medieval church, they basically claim that all these accretions that came in clouded the character of God and God's character became this cold, callous thing. And the reason that people don't come to him is because they don't understand the true character of God. Satan in the great controversy has been working through all these different figures in the in, in like government and stuff through the past and all these different figures to tarnish the character of God. And now the SDAs in this rest restoration of apostolic Christianity, they have the fullness of the character of God restored. And so part of the belief is that if they go out and show people the true character of God, it not only vindicates God's character in the great controversy, but it'll cause people to actually come to God because they'll realize, oh, wow, he doesn't actually torment people in hell forever. Oh, that's a lie. Oh, all these sorts of things. That that's basically yep. what is going on with the that's whole pride. vindication of God's character. It's it's pride because what they're saying is that they have the ability to reveal the true character of God to everybody else. And yet at the same time, they are demolishing the true holy character of God. They yeah. are deceivers. They're not intending to be deceivers, but they are servants of the evil one. You don't God doesn't vindicate his character to anybody. He simply is what he is. We reveal what it is. You simply tell the truth of who he is. They have man centered theology. Oh, it's horrible. Bad. Horrible. Bad. From the pit As it hell. pertains to to what they claim about Colossians 2, it totally backfires on them, Matt, when they so what they try to do is they try to say, because they believe that there's God's law and then Moses's law, two different laws. And Moses's law was written in a book and it was all the ceremonial laws. God's law was what is contained in the Ten Commandments. And those were on stone, not paper. And the stone tablets were kept in the Ark of the Covenant. And according to Deuteronomy 32, the book on the side of the Ark was Moses' law, showing a distinction between the two. Well, they're going to use the King James to say, what the phrase that's used in Deuteronomy 32 for that book is the handwriting of ordinances. So here in Colossians, it's talking about the handwriting of ordinances being nailed to the cross and done away with, but not the Ten Commandments. So that's how they're going to try and get around this sort of, well, it's it's yeah, all or nothing if you're going to say it's about the law. Yeah. However, here's a number of issues it, it poses for them. One, the book of the law that was on the side of the ark contained the entire Pentateuch. So it contained the Ten Commandments twice. Is the same book of the law that was uh, chained to the king's throne, for example, that had to, he had to meditate on day and night. It was the same book of the law that uh, they found after the destruction of the temple. And the king was cut to the heart, uh, not because of ceremonial law, but because of moral law. It was namely idolatry. And it says he tore his clothes, which is a biblical way of just saying he was filled with rage. And he said, immediately get all these idols out of here. How have we fallen into idolatry? God's going to judge us. It contained all of the Pentateuch, the Ten Commandments twice. Second off, they don't believe that all ceremonial law was nailed to the cross because they hold to tithe. They also hold to the Leviticus 11 dietary laws. Those were ceremonial. Furthermore, they don't believe that the Day of Atonement was Jesus' crucifixion day, antitypically speaking. They believe the Day of Atonement started in 1844, and it's this long, drawn-out process. Yet, according to Leviticus 23, the Day of Atonement was part of ceremonial law. So, ironically enough, the one thing that actually was pointing to the Day of Atonement, which is Christ's actual Day of Atonement, where you're saying the ceremonial law was nailed to the cross, you don't have the single thing being nailed to the cross, but it's this long thing that starts off at the future as a long drawn out process yeah 
Let me say something really quickly to the SDA who are listening. You need to study Romans chapter 1, starting at verse 18 to the end of the chapter, because there's a judgment that comes upon people for believing lies and espousing them. There's a judgment upon the heart to believe lies. What we're doing is exposing the lies of, of Seventh-day Adventism using the light of God's word. And if any of you out there saying, no, then you justify this, you justify that. No, no, it's OK. It's OK. Then you need to understand that the judgment of God is upon your heart and your mind for believing these lies. Amen. Not to to that, uh, you know, being a, a cheerful thing, but it's just what you're saying is the truth. It's the truth. Right. The fires that they deny are waiting for them. Yes. So now. As it pertains to perfection in the investigative judgment, Adventists will tell you we don't teach sinless perfectionism. They'll insist they teach Christian perfection and they'll try and appeal to like John Wesley and say we're no different than Methodism, etc. Um, no, Methodist and. <laughs> John Wesley didn't have a great controversy worldview. John Wesley didn't hold to an investigative judgment. Some of them, I've heard some of their scholars try and say, well, the investigative judgment is just the logical conclusion of Arminianism. But they will insist that they teach Christian perfection and that they just believe that people will grow and become more holy over their life. But the standard's not total sinlessness. But notice what Ellen White says regarding the second phase of atonement going on in heaven. Quote, this is from Great Controversy, folks. The biggest of big. Great controversy. They're trying to give a billion copies out this year. Now, while our great high priest is making the atonement for us, we should seek to become perfect in Christ. Okay, let's see what she says that is. Not even a thought could our Savior be brought to yield to the power of temptation. Satan finds in human hearts some point where he can gain a foothold. Some sinful desire is cherished by means of which his temptations assert their power. But Christ declared of himself, the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me, John 14, 30. Satan could find nothing in the Son of God that would enable him to gain the victory. He had kept his father's commandments, and there was no sin in him that Satan could use to his advantage. This is the condition in which those must be found who shall stand in the time of trouble. Close quote. Remember the sanctification chart we looked at earlier, folks. You have to be able to get to a condition that's identical to the Lord Jesus Christ with his assistance and with his help before the close of probation when the time of trouble gets here or you won't be able to stand. How perfect? As perfect as Jesus. As perfect as Jesus. The identical condition that Jesus was in. The time of trouble will come when the investigative judgment ends and probation closes. And if you're not in that identical condition, no sin found in him, you won't be able to make it. So this is what I was saying, Matt, about how they, they'll claim you can have a sinful nature, but not be sinning or not act upon it because you have to get to a condition just like how Jesus did with his help, because then you silence the accusations of Satan as well in the great controversy and you vindicate the character of God. What are your thoughts on that? Well, it's not only not Christian, I like to ask them, I like to say, how's it working out for you? Yeah. Are you doing this? Yeah. Are you being that good? Because Jesus is a standard of righteousness. So are you as good as Christ in your heart? Not just your words and the actions of your hands, but in your heart before him. Are you on the same level as God in flesh, Jesus Christ? Is this how you are going to look? Because if that's the case, then you don't have an advocate. If that's the case, you're... We'll, you will stand before the judgment seat of Christ on your own. Because justification is the imputation of Christ's righteousness to us. We receive, uh, we have a righteousness that's not our own, Philippians 3, 9. And in Romans 4, 3, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Romans 4, 5, to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Now, think about this. If you have two things, one who does not work, but believes. You have work and believe. Does not work, but believe. You have two things. You take one away. The other one's by itself. Faith alone, because faith is only as good as who you put it in. So the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. That's how we're made righteous, because Christ fulfilled the law perfectly. He did everything right, 1 Peter 2.22. He bore our sin in his body on the cross, 1 Peter 2.24. He canceled the sin that at the cross, Colossians 2.14. So by faith, we're justified, Romans 5.1. 1 
not by anything that we do, not by any works. You foolish Galatians, who's, who has bewitched you to think that that which has been begun by the spirit can be perfected by the flesh? That's Galatians 3, 1 and through 3, you should read that. And so <clears throat> you have to understand this. All false religious systems add something to the work of Christ. It's, it's, G, it's faith in Jesus and something. And that's all that's going on here. You can't be found in the same condition of Christ. Uh, that's demoting Christ, uh, saying that you can attain to his level. Really? That's demoting him. Because the only way to attain to his level if he's down by yours. He's God in flesh. There is no way for us to attain to his level in any way, shape, or form. This is foolishness to say that we can be found in the same condition as him and then therefore stand before the throne of God on that. That's foolishness. That's Mormonism. It's Jehovah's Witnesses. It is uh, Roman Catholicism, and it is Eastern Orthodoxy. The very things they deny and snot on are the, the doctrines that they uphold and practice. Yep. Matt, you mentioned <clears throat> you mentioned the mediation of Christ. We have to look at this now. Because what you just described is what they teach. Quote, this is from Christ in his sanctuary, a compilation book of all of her statements regarding the investigative judgment and the process of, of this. It's nine chapters. This is from the chapter discussing the investigative judgment. Notice, quote, those who are living upon the earth when the intercession of Christ shall cease in the sanctuary above. That is when the investigative judgment closes. When this ceases, they are to stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. Their robes must be spotless. Their characters must be purified from sin by the blood of sprinkling. Through the grace of God and their own diligent effort, they must be conquerors in the battle with evil while the investigative judgment is going forward in heaven, while the sins of penitent believers are being removed from the sanctuary. There is to be a special work of purification, of putting away of sin among God's people upon the earth. This work is more closely presented in the message of Revelation 14. Close quote. They believe, contrary to Hebrews 7, which explicitly states that Jesus will cease functioning as a mediator at a point in the future, and at that point will take off what Ellen was shown in vision. Will, he will take off his priestly garments and will assume his kingly garments. And when doing so, he will cease being mediator, and you will have to stand before Almighty God during this time of trouble, which is why you'll have to be able to be in a condition like Christ. Otherwise, Satan will get you during the time of trouble. I got a question. You can answer this better than I could. Do they read the Bible? They claim... <laughs> Matt, they claim to be the ardent, staunch defenders of the Bible. They claim to be the oh. only ones that truly understand and believe the Bible because oh. they claim all of us have been are, are divided up into these innumerable sects and divisions and yada, yada. And they're one unified monolith. I've heard that story from I don't know how many groups out there, but they claim to be this bastion of unity. Now, actually... <laughs> While you bring this up here, uh, we could end up getting sidetracked on this as well, Matt. But yeah. they believe that they've been given what is called the great controversy theme, what Herbert Douglas called the God particle, the equivalent of the God particle. It is the answer to everything. They claim they didn't discover it. This is Ministry Magazine, folks, November or December 2000. They claim to be given the God particle, the theory to everything, which is the great controversy theme. That was given to them by way of Ellen White, and they claim it's the antidote to theological division. Now, this is talking about their scholars here. The average lay SDA has no clue about this. They've just simply been handed something from that's come from higher upstream down to the distilled level where it's being applied in the Sabbath school quarterly, typically, typically, but they're scholars. They're very fully aware of this folks. You can go on our website and look up the great controversy theme. All the primary source documentation is hyperlinked there, but that has bled down to why SDAs oftentimes, not all, but many have a theological superiority complex because they think that they have this ins inspired and fallible interpreter, two million extra words <laughs> added to scripture, essentially. They'll say, no, it's not an addition of the Bible. We, we're sola scriptura, sola scriptura. Don't they know. claim to be sola scriptura. But uh, they have this inspired commentary where Jesus is supposedly giving them the infallible interpretation on all of these various areas. So it's you and I that are in the dark 
they claim to really know the Bible. Yeah, it reminds me of Catholicism again. Uh, they have their sacred tradition. These guys have their sacred prophet. And uh, yeah, it's, both. That's why in the photos, she's, you know, wearing the, the uh -huh. papal tiara. Yeah. Oh, man. See, you're, you're a smart guy. You, you're thinking through this properly. That's good stuff. Yeah. Kudos where it belongs. Uh, you've done a great, uh, great amount of research you guys have uh, and uh, good stuff. I'm really uh, intrigued. But obviously, they're not sticking with Scripture. They're submitting the scriptures to Ellen G. White. They don't understand what sola scriptura means. It means that the scriptures are the final authority in everything it addresses. It doesn't mean we don't look at other things. It means that all other things are under the ultimate authority of God's word. I don't believe they have a sufficient understanding of God's word, which is happening a lot in Protestantism as a whole. Uh, that's another topic as well. But uh, we need to get back to this supremacy of God's word. And if it doesn't agree with God's word, I'm not interested. You know, that's what I say to people. I'll debate them and they'll give me some view and I'll say, show it to me in scripture. And they'll say, well, no, it's in tradition. I don't care. I'm not interested. Show it to me in the word of God. Only the word of God is said to be inspired. Only the word of God is, by God is said to be inspired. So if someone claims their own inspiration, I'm going to check them against the word of God. If they say they don't want to, well, then I'm not interested in having a discussion with you because we have no common ground. And there won't be any common ground until we can understand, if you claim to be a Christian, that the Bible is the final authority because it comes from God. At his very heart, his very word. And by nature, it is a final authority. Whatever God says is what it says, and that's it. So the the teachings here from these people who are backing her up, and they're also false doctrines, they're they're just uh, they're just demonically inspired. I'm sorry, I, you know, I don't want to be super harsh and mean, but they're demonically inspired. They're not teaching Christian theology. They don't understand the Bible. They don't understand who Christ is. They have a false gospel, a false God. Uh, it's just a non-Christian cult, and they're just uh, advocating that. But I will say, i got to say this. I've met many uh, Seventh-day Adventists who affirm that, and I know how to check. They affirm the Orthodox doctrine of the Trinity, the yep. hypostatic union, justification by faith alone, and they dismiss most of everything of what what uh, she says. And okay, I've, you know, okay, we'll talk. And do you have to worship on Saturday to be Christian? No, you don't. There's a, they're like that. So them, I'm not going to condemn. But the other ones, <clears throat> man, so much yeah, heresy, the, so little time. The inconsistent Adventist. And with yes. that individual, I always then just go to, then why would you remain? If you know the gospel, that's it. if you know Christ, the true Christ, why would you remain in an organization that's cursed by God? Oh, because you're comfortable. Okay, well, Christ calls you out of your comfort. So you're willing to follow him out of the comfort? That's where I go. There's zero reason to remain a part of an organization that is under the curse of God very plainly. But what we often find with, with SDAs is that the, the plain didactic passages are obscure, but the apocalyptic passages are just crystal clear. <laughs> yes. You know, That's Revelation true. 14, they can tell you every sign, symbol, number, seal. But uh, Paul, the false gospel in Galatians 1, well, Paul was a, a, had a legal background. And, you know, you have to understand it's really complex. and. Ah, okay. Well, Matt, to close us out here, we're at our final final aspect of, of the atonement. This is absolutely horrible. It's blasphemous. It is demonic. Yep. This doctrine, um, really just this one in particular really irks me. With regards to sin actually being disposed of in this system because it wasn't at Calvary, quote, in the typical service, talking about Leviticus 16, the high priest, having made the atonement for Israel, came forth and blessed the congregation. So Christ, at the close of his work as mediator, will appear without sin unto salvation, Hebrews 9.28, to bless his waiting people with eternal life. As the priest, in removing the sins from the sanctuary, confessed them upon the head of the scapegoat, so Christ will place all of these sins upon Satan, the originator and instigator of sin. The scapegoat bearing the sins of Israel was sent away unto a land not inhabited, Leviticus 16.22. So Satan, bearing the guilt of all the sins which he had caused God's people to commit, will for a thousand years be confined to the earth, which will then be desolate without inhabitant, and he will at last suffer the full penalty of sin in the fires that shall destroy all the wicked. Thus the, the great plan of redemption will reach its accomplishment, in the final eradication of sin and the deliverance of all who have ever been willing to renounce evil. Close quote. So the atonement is not complete 
until Jesus transfers the sins that he has transferred to the sanctuary from there onto Satan, who will then be banished to bear the penalty for them since he is the originator of sin. Matt, what are your thoughts on this? And then I will have one final quote where they expound upon this in the exposition of their own beliefs. Well, it's a denial of the sufficiency of the atoning sacrifice of Jesus. And then it adds the evil one as being part of how we get saved through his scapegoat uh, work. This is blasphemy. It's blasphemy. And if you're an SDA and you believe this, I cannot call you a brother in Christ or a sister in Christ. I can only assume you're on your way to the eternal fires that you deny. I'm not saying this to be sensationalistic. I'm saying it because you need to hear the truth. The SDA church is not Christian. If this is what they're teaching, this is not it. And I've known about this scapegoat theology for a long time, and it is, it's horrible. Jesus said it was finished on the cross. To affirm that is to say that Jesus was wrong. It was not finished. And yeah, I know what they do with the words and how you say it wasn't this and was that. And yeah, I get that. And we can debate those. We can go into those things. But um, it's demonic doctrine and you need to repent of it. Let me give you a, a quick gospel message. Just something really simple. Jesus Christ is God in flesh. Okay, I can give you all the rest, references for that. I'll, I'll skip all the references stuff. He's God in flesh. He has all authority in heaven and earth. Jesus says, come to him. He, uh, he will give you rest. And you and in the Bible, he's prayed to. So if you were to pray to Jesus and ask Jesus to forgive you of all of your sins, will he forgive you of all of your sins? He has the authority. He does it. Again, if you were to pray and ask Jesus to forgive you of all of your sins, will he forgive you of all of your sins? If you say no, you don't know the Jesus of the Bible. If you say yes, you don't need the investigative judgment. You don't need the satanic scapegoat. All you need is Jesus Christ and him crucified. Put your faith and trust in Jesus and him alone. Not anybody else. Not me. Not Ellen G. White. Put it in the Lord Jesus Christ. Get on your knees. Bow your heart. Ask Jesus to forgive you. Ask Jesus to redeem you. Ask Jesus to cleanse you of all of your sins. Trust in him, not your works, not your goodness, but in him alone. And you will then, if you, for real, you will enjoy true salvation. But I have to warn you, to do that means you may understand also how evil the SDA theology ultimately really is. Because the light of God will come into your heart and will shed, it will shove the shadows away and you'll see what the truth is. Come to Christ. Yeah. Um, man, there's, there's just so much. I mean, Matt, this whole thing breaks down. So I debated an SDA pastor on this. You can check that out on the channel, folks. I said the same thing that Matt said with the blessing of my elders. I actually asked them about that beforehand. This is blasphemous doctrine. If you believe this, you are ascribing a part of the, the perfect completed work of Christ to the devil there are so many problems that this creates. You are essentially saying what they're going to say here in this exposition of their beliefs. So Matt, because Leviticus 16 says the scapegoat played a role in atonement, they obviously had to address that somehow. So notice what their appendix of, or rather the, the footnote on this chapter in their fundamental beliefs book, which is the official released exposition of their own beliefs. Okay. Quote, if Azazel represents Satan, how can scripture connect him with the atonement? Yeah, that's a great question, right? As the high priest, after having cleansed the sanctuary, placed the sins on Azazel, who was forever removed from God's people, so Christ, after having cleansed the sanctuary, will place the confessed and forgiven sins of his people on Satan, who will then be forever removed from the saved. Now they insert the SDA Bible commentary. How fitting that the closing act of the drama of God's dealing with sin should be returned upon the head of Satan of all the sin and guilt that issuing from him originally once brought such tragedy to the lives of those freed of sin by Christ's atoning blood. Thus the cycle is completed. The drama ended. Only when Satan, the instigator of all sin, is finally removed can it truly be said that sin is forever blotted out of God's universe. In this accommodated sense, 
we may understand that the scapegoat has a part in the atonement. Leviticus 16.10 With the righteous saved, the wicked cut off, and Satan no more, then, not till then, will the universe be in a state of perfect harmony as it was originally before sin entered. Close quote. So in that accommodated sense, Satan is a part of the atonement. Sin is not fully disposed of and taken care of until he bears it away into annihilation. Matt, final thoughts on this or anything else that we've looked at. Thank you so much for being here, and I appreciate everything you've done with CARM. Always happy to uh, help regarding any info that you may need regarding Adventism or finer details. I know that you are a minutia guy, kind of like I am. I'm looking forward to also seeing you in person here in a couple of weeks when you're in my neck of the woods. Any final thoughts? Yes, turn away from Seventh-day Adventism, the false prophet of Ellen G. White, the false gospel of, of the SDA. Come to Jesus Christ. Satan is not in any way assisting uh, by accident even in the atoning sacrifice of Christ. He is the only one who atoned and bore our sin. Satan does not bear our sin in any way, shape, or form. To say that is to deny the crucifixion's efficacious nature that means you would be denying that jesus actually accomplished what he was called to accomplish by god the father on the cross that is seriously a humongous offense against god the judgment of god will be upon all those who would continue to cast aspersions and doubt uh, upon that cross and that crucifixion of god on the cross and who would say that it's not finished and that there needs to be an investigation that you have to be found worthy you have to keep commandments you have to do what you got to do and that satan will participate in the scapegoat theory which denies the penal substitutionary atoning theory but that's another thing you have to uh you have to repent come to christ ask jesus to forgive you of all of your sins look to him and look to no one else Trust in Jesus because he's enough. He's God. He did it all. Okay. Amen, Matt. Again, thank you for being here. Folks, thank oh. you for being here as well. This was a, a great discussion, Matt. I would love to have you back sometime specifically to talk about uh, or maybe just even teach, just let you do the, the majority of the talking on things like uh, the perichoresis, hypostatic union, that sort of stuff. These sort of basics that, again, within Adventism are basically uh, reserved only for, you know, the theologian types. But even then they deny some of these things like divine simplicity, etc. So maybe we can set that up sometime again. Like sure. I said, I will see you in a couple weeks, folks. I will see you guys as well on the other side as as always, thank you for being here. God bless. Uh, come out of her, my people, like the SDA church always tells us to come out of her, quote unquote, the whore of Babylon. Come out of Ellen White, false gospel, false God. Come know the truth. You can uh, have all of your sins forgiven, not just your past sins. Jesus doesn't impart his righteousness to, uh, to you gradually. Uh, everything that Matt pointed out as well, uh, it's hogwash. It's hogwash. It's not biblical. Reject it. Come know the truth. Until next time, God bless. <laughs>